Good afternoon to you. I'm Jaron Jordan. We are breaking into your programming this afternoon to bring you live coverage of a news conference that is set to begin at any minute now at the Diocese of Baton Rouge, where Bishop Michael Duca will release the names of clergy members that have been credibly accused of sexual abuse. Let's take a listen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, today I have the sad and profoundly humbling task of publishing the names of all priests, and in our case, a bishop and one seminarian, against whom there are credible allegations of sexual abuse of minors and or vulnerable adults in the Diocese of Baton Rouge. This list is based on the review of all 1,033 clergy personnel files of the Diocese of Baton Rouge from its formation in 1961 to the present. When I committed myself in the diocese to this task soon after my arrival, my first concern was and has been for the persons victimized by this abuse who have often felt betrayed and unsupported by the church. It has been my hope that this will be an important step that will help those men and women whose lives have been so deeply violated. I've also hoped that this will give a sense of the scope of the allegations in this diocese. My prayer is that this list will be a sign of a new level of transparency and openness in the way we respond to allegations of abuse and care for the victims. Some have asked why we must do this. As I said in my Sunday letter, the fact that this wound will not heal tells us that we must continue to bring everything into the light. This is not easy. I have listened to some victims share their stories and there are no words to express the depth of sadness and shame that was experienced in our church, or that we should experience in our church, and that this is a part of our history. It's hard to lay this list out for all to see, but real renewal and healing cannot take place until we acknowledge the truths of the past. The list, this list reflects the lives of real people and a path of pain and suffering that affects most deeply the persons who are victims of abuse, but also their friends and family that journey with them, and even innocent family members of the priests who are accused. Each name represents a unique case. Some only had one victim. Others' abuse gouged a wide path of pain in the lives of many victims. In some cases, the victims were male and in others, female. But there is one thing most importantly, and that is, most importantly, that they all have in common, that they all have been credibly accused of sexual abuse of a minor or minors. I know that there may be some names that are a surprise and some revelations that will cause pain in extended families and friends. I deeply regret this. It is my hope that all those friends and family affected by this list will be treated with the respect they deserve. In the process of creating the list of names, I have heard from some, and even felt this myself in the beginning, that once this is done, we can move beyond the Christ mode and get back to normal. But I've come to see quite clearly that in this thinking, there is already a return to an old standard to once again get this done, and then sweep it under the carpet. This list is not the end, but an attempt to open the door on sexual abuse that none of us want to open. In every case of abuse on this list, I am sure that the victim was told, don't tell anyone. They heard this from their abuser, but also from the church, sometimes overtly. Okay, we'll take care of Father, you just keep this a secret or they felt an unspoken, institutionally expressed rule of the church that you are just not supposed to talk about these things. Unfortunately, to keep the status quo, the victims of abuse must bear the pain for others' peace of mind and must do this alone. My hope is that this list is a concrete sign that we do want to talk about this. Hopefully, a victim of abuse will see a name on this list and say, that's me. And this will encourage them or give them the courage to go to a trusted friend, counselor, family member, or even if they want to come talk to me and share their story so they might no longer bear the pain alone. We must be willing to share their pain, admit our part in the tragedy, 
so we can ease their burden and be, for the victims of sexual abuse, a support and not a barrier to the path of healing. So this list is not the final piece of dealing with this, but rather I see it as the beginning in a foundational change in the church's way of acting that will renew all the programs we have in place to protect our children with a focus on healing the victims of abuse rather than the protection of the status quo. I wanted to give that context because what, one of the things that I have experienced as I've gone through this is the reality that besides all, that I, I think we've thrown up a lot of programs, but I think what I'm realizing, and I think many bishops are realizing too, is that you can throw up a bunch of programs, but if you still keep the fundamental kind of attitude of trying to protect, of trying to keep hidden, even the most progressive programs can be turned to a wrong intention. So I'm really hoping that we begin to change the way we do things as a whole in the church, and one of that is to be more open and more vulnerable in dealing with those, especially who suffer from abuse, but hopefully in other areas as well. But those are my opening remarks. Oh, one last thing I wanted to say, and I didn't put it in this list. It's said in this frequently asked questions, but we do see this as a dynamic list. That is, we will continue to update it as new information comes in. We will continue to um, add names if they arise in the future or if new information comes forward. And so with that, those are my opening statements, at least for now. And Are there questions? If so, please identify yourself and your media outlet the first time you ask a question. Um, there's three different lists, sort of. Could you explain what those are? Oh, yeah, that's okay. A lot of it has to do with the fact that we were made a diocese in 1961. Okay. And so uh, at, we, before that, we were the diocese of, of New Orleans. And so what happens in the diocese is that when a diocese is formed, the priests that become part of that diocese, their files are all transferred over to that diocese. But if a man had worked in the area but did not transfer, his files were kept in Baton Rouge. So what you have is, first of all, the list of all the files that we have and information that comes from us for priests that are, have been in our diocese. Um, the second group is... The second one are those who have credible allegations that occurred within our territory before its creation in 1960. What I wanted to do, first of all, is make sure that any information we had about a priest that served in this area, that shows up on any list, comes on our list, okay? So the second group is those whose allegations occurred within the territory of Baton Rouge before its creation in 1961. Why that's important is that if, a, if, a, if someone has an accusation against a priest before we became a diocese, chances are that some of those files are in New Orleans. So the case goes to New Orleans, okay? What we're trying to do is get the most fullest presentation of anyone that worked in this area, but may not be in this area, or who may have had a credible abuse case in some other diocese, but worked to here. So these are all just different kind of ways in which we're collecting data. The second group is the ones that came out of the, the Archdiocese of New Orleans report, and those priests that were named, even though they may not have had a credible accusation here in our diocese, they had one there, because they worked in our diocese, then we listed them here as well. And the last one are those that have shown up on the Archdiocese of New Orleans, the Jesuit order list, and um, which is another list. With, came, some of those Jesuits worked in our diocese as well. So specific to the Baton Rouge diocese is the first list? Those are the ones that are priests of our diocese. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Identify uh, yourself, please. Yes. Uh, Harrison Golden, WVLA, uh, Channel 30, right here in Baton Rouge. The term credibly accused, if you could sort of break down what exactly that is. Okay. A credible allegation for us, and I think it's listed in one of the, in the, um, and I want to read this because it does, it does help to say it pretty succinctly. Um, a credible allegation is one which meets the foregoing definition, and the Bishop of the Diocese of Baton Rouge believes with moral certitude after careful investigation and consultation with professionals that an incident of sexual abuse of a minor or vulnerable adult occurred or probably occurred 
with the possibility that it did not occur being highly unlikely. Moral certain, so that's, that's what it is. So it's, um, it's not the same determination of law. We may make a determination that may not hold up in court, but because of the information that we have, the context, sometimes there's one witness that comes forward, but then another comes forward, which again, continues to add more credibility. So it's built on that investigation. And, um, and it, it becomes pretty clear sometimes, the knowledge the person has um, that uh, something really did happen. Sometimes down the line, the priest actually admits, but uh, that's, what, that's the determination we use. And it's in the frequently asked questions. Yes? Andrea Gallo with The Advocate. Uh, Bishop, did the diocese reach out to the priests and the victims uh, during this process if you knew you were going to be naming these priests? We did not reach out to the victims. We had some victims call to be sure that the name was on the list, but, um, and, um, but we did not reach out to the victims. What about the priests? The priests that are on the list were made, well, the, the priests or the former priests mainly, were let know that their name would be on the list. And some of the dates of the like, reports being made against these priests were in 2018 or pretty recent. So during this process, did you have new allegations uh, coming forward, new victims coming forward? Well, I have, I have two other announcements to make at the end of this, but, and, and it'll give some, give some answer to that question. But um, we did have people coming forward. Many of them, some came forward to tell stories about people we already knew about. But uh, there was one on the list, I think, that was relatively recent. It's a, it's a historic case, but we just found out about it recently. Yes? Um, there's been sort of a dip in um, people coming to the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. Do you think releasing these names is going to help that or hinder that, make it worse? Or I don't know. I, mean, I, I, I didn't think about that, actually. Um, that's not the reason I'm doing it, but um, I, I don't know. I would, I, I'm, I'm hoping that, and, and believe me, every step we do, we're trying our best to, to do this in a respectful way, but also a way that's, that's genuine. I'm trying to be genuine about this, and um, I just have to let that speak for itself. I think if the reason people have not come back to the church is because they feel it can't be trusted, that we're trying to hide things, that we're acting in a clandestine way that's detrimental to people. I hope this is one step that might help clear some of that up. Um, that's something I'll ha I think people, you have to earn trust. And I think hopefully this is a step. And um, so I'm hoping it has a positive effect. And um, there are many different reasons why people have stopped coming to church, but I know this is a major one for some people. Yes. Well, I mean, we have a tremendous amount of programs now, and, and, the, and our, the way we handle cases is so different now since we've put into the, uh, the programs of safe environment and protecting God's children. Um, and those are the programs I'm talking about that have to do with the way we, we gather information. Usually information would come in to usually one of the priests, vicar general or the bishop, and the decision about what happened to that priest was decided by those people. Now when a, when a, when a person calls in with a, um, an accusation, allegation, uh, it goes to our victim's coordinator, assistance coordinator, who then hands it on to a group of lay people, our um, uh, independent review board, sorry, I get some independent review board, who reviews it, and then they come to the bishop and tell the bishop, bishop, we believe this is a credible allegation. And this is, we believe, is your next action. And then what happens once it's that, then the priest is removed. There's very concrete programs like that. But they all have to, you know, any program has to be inspired with a fundamental change of attitude as well. And you have to be willing to embrace that, that program fully. Because it leads you down roads that you don't want to go, you know. It leads, down, it leads you down roads that people um, don't want to see. They're not used to that. You know, for example, I had this in my experience in Dallas. A priest was credibly accused. So I was sent to the parish one Sunday, which we do here, uh, and we will, we haven't, I haven't done it, but we would do it if, it, if this was the case. He was a sitting pastor when it happened, 
and stand up in front of the people and say, Father so-and-so has been removed because of a credible accusation of, self, uh, of, of sexual abuse against minors. Okay? If you have any uh, knowledge of this or you'd like to come forward for yourself, please do so. And the people were angry. They liked that pastor. You know? But that had to be said out loud. And, um, and so th those are things people are not used to hearing. And they'd rather not hear it sometimes. But if we're going to have an open discussion about this and really begin to address the issue, then you have to be honest about that. Because otherwise, uh, the priest may still have access to homes, may still have access. They think he's just going off for medical care or something. And so if the priest is, is absolved, then he can come back to ministry because there's further investigation that goes on. But um, so those are the kind of programs I'm talking about. Seminaries are continually trying to review their programs, especially now, to make sure that they add programs and education and experiences that help develop a person's sexual maturity. Also, look for telltale signs of that that might, you know, show they're not mature enough for priestly ministry. Uh, for example, Notre Dame. What Notre Dame has done is they have partnered with a parish, local parish. So a lot of the, the experience the students are having is in actual parish life with other you know, people in the parishes, men and women, who also kind of participate in their evaluation. And I know from first hand that uh, talking to a lot of women, that women pick up things differently than men do. And sometimes they can be a good uh, test and evaluator. But I'm, that's a little bit of your answer to your question. But believe me, all seminaries right now are reviewing their, um, their practices and their formation programs. We we offer them immediately. Um, they, they can come in and talk to our assistance coordinator herself, Amy Cordon, and um, but also we offer them counseling, a counsel they can choose, or we provide. We can offer them some suggestions, but also we, we journey with them. So, for example, when I got here in August, and all these things were stirring up, you know, um, Amy came and talked to me and explained to me what she does. And then said, you know, I'm getting a lot of calls right now. Because every time this becomes part of the public debate, it stirs up all these feelings again. And so they, call, they were calling in to say, look, I'm getting all out of whack again. Can you give me some counsel? And we, we, we journey with them. We don't just give three months of counseling or two months of counseling and say, okay, we're done now. We journey with them. If they wish us to journey with them, to help them in that way. And so they have a contact person. If they start kind of losing it, they know they can come back to someone that, that understands their case and understands what's going on. Um, so that's what we do for the victims, you know, and, and we try our best to give them the care that, that they need to help through this. Because it's it's, oftentimes it's a lifetime of healing, if you ever really fully heal it from it at all. Bishop, I'm curious what Matt Houston with WAP, what damage has this done to the church? Well, I think a, a lot of damage, a damage to our credibility, a damage to the, the institution of the priesthood, um, I mean, just across the board. I think it's, it's damaged some of the moral strength of the church's teaching. Um, but I think it can be recovered if we can, in a sense, uh, recover um, kind of our grounding in this. I think what's happened is that we got into the mode from the very beginning of throwing up a wall of protection. And we really need to look at being um, more vulnerable and more attentive to the pain of the victim. Now, I'm, I'll get real personal with you. You know, when, when I was in Dallas, we dealt with some, a very serious case of child abuse. And um, I remember some of the initial conversations about this priest. And everyone was concerned about the priest and finding out what was going on with the priest. And I remember those concerns. But I have to tell you, when I, when, when I go back and look over where did the diocese make the biggest mistake, I realize it's because we never stop to consider the pain of the victims. We were always focused on the priest. The, the, we, we had a child, I don't know, we thought, oh, they'll get over it, or it's not that big a deal. If you've not been a victim of abuse, then you, 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 you minimize it. I think we minimize it because it's too painful to look at. Even when priests we're doing horrific things, people, some people say, oh, I, I can't believe that. I just can't believe that. We don't want to believe it. It's too hard. And I'm sure the same dynamics work in families as well. But we don't want to look at it because if you open that up, it causes a lot of pain, a lot of 
kind of it breaks the status quo. It breaks the, the harmony that everybody wants to have in a family, and even we want to have in the church. And so I think that you know, we, we lost a lot of credibility because we threw up the walls. And I think that we're trying to find a place now where we can maybe model something that might actually be helpful to people in dealing with this even in their own families. But you have to be vulnerable. You have to be willing to kind of let down the walls. And I, and I hope this list is a way of doing that. Um, it's a hard thing, this list. It, it, it affects a lot of people's lives, but it's our way of trying to be open about this. In practice, how do you do that? How do you let down the walls? Well, you do this, and the way you receive people when they come forward through allegations, you don't just accuse them. You, you, know, you, you bring them in. You immediately give them the counseling they, they need, and you journey with them. Uh, you act swiftly when you see something that's present, for example, a priest or a situation that demands attention that's done swiftly, the person's taken out, the people of the parish are, recon are told what, what's happening, you know, so they can protect their children, they can go ask their children, did anything happen? You know, that's one of the biggest complaints. They say, well, how can you tell us? Maybe our children were involved in this, and we had no way of even protecting our children. So those are the kind of ways in which we get out, and you know, yes, and there's a lot of criticism that comes from that, there's a lot of uh, but at the same time, that's the way you have to do it. That's the way we do things. And that's hopefully one of the ways you begin to build a new environment of trust. Um, so. Any other questions? Uh, uh, yes. uh, Bonnie Graham with the yeah. Commentator. What was the catalyst for this investigation? You had just gotten here. Well, I, I think I wrote an article in the, in the, in the um, Commentator, but I think it was the two things happened. One was the. Um, Illinois, um, what was it, uh, how do they term that? The Illinois Grand Jury uh, Review of Abuse in, in, this, in the Diocese of, of Illinois. Um, it's, 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 a, it's a document that has some criticism, but what's, what's true and not controvertible is that they gave concrete descriptions of what sexual abuse of a minor is like. Okay? We've always talked about it, but no one's put a face on it. They put a face on it. And that opened people's eyes again. And at the same time, we had the Cardinal McCarrick scandal. That here was someone who was known to be an abuser, but still was walking around at high levels of church life. Those two things together just said, wait a minute, this is not working. And there was a call, first of all, to greater accountability of bishops and a greater accountability of the church. And they said, you know, if this is happening, what else is happening? And so there's, there was a call, I think, that one of the things that we need to do is, because there was always this discussion about what, is, what are the dioceses hiding in their secret files, okay? Well, in our case, in our diocese, we have personnel files. But when an allegation comes in against a priest, we create another file that goes into a confidential file. Confidential because that file now will begin to contain the names of other names. Victims, for example, people involved that demand another level of confidentiality. And so that, those are what we call you our secret files. They're just another set of files that have a higher level of confidentiality, and they're managed pretty much by our victim's assistant coordinator. And so, um, so those things are, I think that was a catalyst for it. And I think that um, everyone is finding this is a, a first step a way to kind of begin to build some credibility again and to kind of also do away some of the myths about what's going on behind the scenes and also to acknowledge some things that generally went on that need to be changed and uh, we need to accept the, the uh, responsibility for. Yes, sir. Andrew, and then in the back. Andrew, and then in the back. Okay. Looking at the dates, the time frames of a lot of this abuse, it seems like the majority of it was happening in the 70s You know, I don't know how, this is a larger sociological question that I, I really don't know that may have to do with seminary formation back then. Um, I, I, I don't know. Uh, obviously, we know that Bishop Sullivan's on this list. And, you know, to be honest, when you have a certain view of the world, you're going to see things differently. I used to say in the seminary, 
Um, if the, if the uh, seminary faculty, much of this was happening in many dioceses. So it's hard to know why that is the case, but um, there's, a, there's an old report, the John Jay report that was, came out, that was commissioned by the, the bishops early on that did a big, deep research into this and maybe a source of some answers there. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Hi, my name is Brendan Tomini. I'm a survivor of the actual abuse. That oh, took gosh. Place. And I wanted to um, ask some questions. I was told today that a list of names is going to be read. Are you reading the list of names, or are you just handing out a list of names? We're handing out the list of names to be published by anyone. It'll be on our website. It'll be. Was somewhat, I don't mind reading them out if you think people will play the whole thing. I, I, I can read them out. I don't, we don't want to plan to read them out. We just want to disseminate them as fully as we can throughout the diocese. Okay, so I have, um, like I said, I was an actual survivor of the you know, cult in several situations. The main problem that people have is the hiding and the you know, starting over again, and just, it'll go away, and it'll hide, it'll hide, it'll hide. That's the issue that the public has. And last week, you were quoted as, in the advocate, as stating, the majority of people just wish this would go away and we get past it. I don't think that's what the majority of people want, in my opinion. Okay. I think it's, they want to know it's not happening right now under their noses, again, today, the same way it happened in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. You, is, you know, instead, your statement was people get over it and just sweep it past. But um, why don't, you know, in the 50s, when y'all started buying insurance policies to combat the future idea that you're going to be having sexual abuse issues, why not make that statement in the 60s and stop hiding it? Why not? You know, stop the issues going on instead of a continuing role. Decade, I mean, it's not like this is a short-term problem. Right. It's decade after decade. And lastly, I don't want to end on a sour note. Y'all have done a lot for me personally. I know y'all helped other survivors. I appreciate it. But, um, you know, thanks for taking my question. Well, let me, first of all, it's hard for me to answer for the past. But... Um, I can tell you that there was, and I try to say that there was a culture that was always trying to protect and somehow never allowed the voice of the victims to come forward and never allowed the church to, they were scared to even reach out to anyone lest they have to, I guess, pay lots of money, okay, to be real honest. And so it was a closing down of things. And... Um, and what I'm trying to do here is trying to say that I don't want this to stop. I, I mean, the people that, I, I should say, I should have said it this way. A lot of people that complain to me say, I wish this would just go away, okay? Because, and, and I, try, I always tell them, it won't go away. And the only way we, and I, the honest thing is this. Right now, I can honestly say I am not aware of any hint or uh, possibility that this is going on in our diocese right now. Okay? I have no hint, no, no little weird feeling that this is happening, okay? And no one has come to me with any kind of recent complaints, okay? But I'll also tell you that part of our, our, our program, in the best sense of the word, is that this has got to be a church. The church has to have their eyes open all the time, okay? And I'll give you an example. When I was in Dallas, there was a priest that told me this story. He was preparing for Saturday night. Holy Saturday Mass, okay? He was a couple servers short. Some guy walked into the sacristy and said, Oh, Father, I see that you're having some problem here. Um, can I help you? He said, Yes. You know how to use a sensor? Yes. Well, why don't you work with those two guys over there and you be the sensor? He said, Okay. So he, he served the whole Mass, okay? Um, after Mass, one of the parishioners came up. He said, Father, I think that guy was at another place. And I think the pastor kicked him out of the parish for some reason. Okay? And turn to find out, yes, there was a big problem there. And this guy was beginning the process, as you know, to get into the system 
and begin to groom and make himself a part of the system, okay? But it's, it's, it's got to be a work that everybody's got to have their eyes open, you know, to, to be aware of this problem, to be aware that there are predators out there that are looking, and to, to, to name them, even if it is the priest, even if it is someone in authority in their church, okay? So that's how we, act, in a sense, provide a safe environment. But I'll tell you, sometimes people are resistant to that. And I, and, and I keep pushing it. All of our volunteers have to be, go through the, some simple basic training about how to spot this, how to help people, how to identify it. And we try to incorporate all that into our schools. There is a, you know, um, when I go to a school now, I haven't gone to many yet, when I was in Shreveport, I'd always come up, I'd kind of, I wouldn't tell them what time I'm coming. And I'd go up and say, make sure the doors were locked. But I couldn't get in. You know, oh, Bishop, we're sorry. No, no, I'm glad. I'm glad I couldn't get in. Because that's the way it's supposed to be. So that's my hope is, is that we can build into a, 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 an environment of protection, an environment of awareness that is, first of all, keeps it from happening. But when it does happen, that we act decisively and caringly. And um, that's all I can promise to try to do. Okay. I'll be glad to read it here if someone I'm would not come. Today, like today or church okay. Or whatever, okay. Everybody's going to read it. I could do that maybe. Okay. I'll think about that. Thank you. That's a Any other questions? Yes. Um, have you or do you plan on submitting this list to the DA? Have you been in talking? Oh, yeah. All the, in fact, I think all the letters have gone out already. Okay. Every case has been reported. Probably another time, but we've, we've done it all again for the historical cases, anything. They're, they're looking into them. Some of them are, are just, the, the age is long, the priests are deceased, uh, but they're, they're looking into every case. I, in fact, I saw the DA the other night, and he said, we're reviewing all the cases, finding who's dead, who's alive. And um, I have two more announcements real quick before we leave, but yes? Really quick. Um, people that are watching this that might come to church on Sunday, uh, what do you have to say to them? I have to say to them what I said last week. The, you know, the letter I sent last really said it all that this is the process that we're doing to help build trust, but also to help hopefully uh, provide a platform that people see that we want to talk about this and we want victims who have not come forward to come forward. I mean, I have, a, I have some sad stories, one of an older man that, you know, just wanted to tell someone. This happened when he was very young and been carrying it all his life. He, he, he kind of dealt with it, but he, once we started this, we started this, we've had several people come and just tell their stories of priests we already knew were abusers, but to tell their stories. And I've sat and listened to some, it's just, I just it can't believe it. You know, it's just, it's hard to listen to, but yet I, I want to share that pain with them, and it's difficult. Now, let me give you two concrete examples of some of the effect of this. Give me, I need one. Yes, sir. Since, since we started, we've had two situations arise that uh, demands some attention. Um, and so these two announcements will be read um, this Sunday at these particular churches. And um, I'm pretty sure it's this Sunday. It'll depend on if they have any that's going to keep them doing it. But anyway, to be read at St. Aloysius Parish at all Sunday Masses. As your bishop, with deep sadness, I must inform you that the Dawson Victim Assistance Office has recently received credible allegations that in the mid-1960s, some altar boys were sexually abused by a volunteer worker at St. Aloysius Parish. The names of the accused is Everett Gautier, Gautier, senior deceased. If you know of such instances or were a victim of such abuse, please contact Amy Corda, Victim Assistance Coordinator on the Dawson 24-hour sexual abuse hotline at that number. 225-242-0250. The Diocese of Baton Rouge is prepared to offer immediate outreach and compassionate assistance. On that, we've had um, several credible allegations already. Um, and so this is the kind of, this came forward, I think, because someone felt, uh, hopefully, it felt encouraged to come forward. Then we have this one. Which is, this, you, normally what would happen is that this, I would not have a press conference for this. Normally what would happen is this would happen automatically within our own investigation. We would have, these both have been reported immediately to law enforcement. If they had started an investigation, we would have backed off. But since this is a deceased and we would continue on with our process. And to St. Thomas More, 
As your bishop with deep sadness, I must inform you that an allegation of sexual abuse has been made against a member of the clergy serving St. Thomas More Parish during the early mid to mid 1970s. Uh, early to mid 1970s. The, the victim is uncertain of the identity of the perpetrator. This allegation is being taken seriously and is being investigated. Anyone having information regarding sex abuse of a minor by a member of the clergy during the early to mid 1970s or any time should call Amy Cordon, Victim Assistance Coordinator on the Dawson 24 hour sexual abuse hotline at 225 242 0250. Oftentimes, when we get an uh, allegation, uh, a person is not able to remember everything completely, but there was enough information in the story to connect it with uh, the parish and things that went on at the parish at that time. Um, the obvious people we knew that were there, um, they were shown pictures, they were to know it's not that person, not that person. So we've, we've exhausted all of our opportunities um, and so we're just trying to see if we can find out. Maybe there was someone else there that had that same experience and we might help them come forward and they may provide more information. So this is the way our process normally works but I think this is a direct um, result of us speaking more openly and honestly about this. Uh, there's more to do. I'm not saying that we're finished on this, and I pray God that I can hold to the task, and I welcome any criticism that comes from someone who, in fact, I need to. You've been listening to Bishop Michael Duca from the uh, Diocese of Baton Rouge for the last 37 minutes or so, making statements and uh, answering questions after releasing the names of priests who he says are credibly and have been credibly accused of sexual abuse. By my count, there are 37 priests, both uh, former priests, they may be deceased, that have been uh, named, that were released this morning. He broke them down into different categories. We uh, are, are processing all of the, the names that have been released, and we will post those for you on our website. Site, that's brproud.com, as well as the full statements from Bishop Michael Duca. Again, he uh, said that this was a sad and humbling task to release these names, but he hopes that it does some good for the church and the Diocese of Baton Rouge moving forward uh, to be this transparent, saying that, uh, you know, the real renewal and healing cannot take place until we acknowledge the truth of our past. So again, that complete list we're going to have posted for you on our website, brproud.com. We'll take you back to your regular programming now. Be sure to tune in tonight at 5.30, our Harrison Golden is in the room there with Bishop Michael Duca. He's going to have a full report coming up tonight. You've been watching a special report right here on Fox 44. I'm Jaron Jordan. We'll send you back to programming.